Greetings and welcome to the Halloween edition of the Sliders Review. And I'm here today to talk to you about Slasher Season 1 Executioner. So this came back out in 2016 and it was on the Chiller um, Network. It's a Canadian television show. But for Americans, we got to see it on Netflix, which is how I watched it many years ago back when I used to do Netflix. I have been wanting to talk about season one forever. I've reviewed season four and season five. I personally don't like season four and five, but season four is better than five. But season five was just a mess. And from my opinion, like I've reviewed the entire series just to give you a snippet of here and there. And I recommended the show and I said season one through three, one, two and three are extremely good. And I stand by that. Although season one, while very good, it is not great only because of the simple fact they was trying to find their footing and, you know, figure out how they're going to set this show up. By season two, they improved on the format and it was amazing. Season three was a little irritating because they brought up politics, but not just anybody's politics, American politics from the whole Trump versus Hillary thing. And by that time, people was tired of that. The show was created by Aaron Martin, and he is best known for writing shows like Degrassi and that of uh, Being Erica. In fact, Being Erica, which was just like a regular, um, it's kind of like a, it's not, it's, it's kind of drama, kind of not, um, kind of Ally, um, Ally McBeal-ish type of way, but like, you know, many of the cast actually appear regularly in Slasher because Slasher is an anthology series. It's basically Canada's version of America Horror Story, but it deals with just a slasher killer and not the supernatural. And so he wrote every episode in season one. And like I said before, I like season one. I just don't particularly think it's like the greatest ever. Season one had mixed reviews because the format, see, here's the thing. Slasher is very innovative. Slasher is very unique and Slasher is very, very original, especially with their kills and everything. People in Canada, they go there. <laughs> the way the killer will kill people is gross and disgusting. And not only that, but the killer just doesn't kill one way. He kills multiple different ways. And in fact, that's how it is in every season. It is gross. It is gory. And if you love that type of stuff, then when you see this person kill people like this on a television show, you will be shocked and surprised at just how far they go there, especially in season two. The show is very well diverse. Aaron has said he's not a social, what is this? Social justice warrior type person. He just likes diversity and wants to show as much of it as possible. The cast, you know, is uh, multiracial. There are um, strong women in here and there is the LGBT. It is not just them saying they're like a gay couple. They actually act like an actual couple. And this is one of the most diverse, like slashery type things you will ever see in horror. And so the thing is, the problem most people have with season one, and me in particular, is that when you watch the first episode, it is established right then and there that like the main focus is going to be on this one female character. She is our lead in the show. She is our final girl. And it shows what happened to her before she was even born. The original killer literally killed her parents, cut her out her mom's womb right um, like about weeks before she was about to be born. And so she's all grown up. And so the first episode focuses directly on her and she finds out secrets about her parents and this and that as the killer is chasing her and stuff like that. 
you assume, and it would have made way more sense if the entire season would have focused on her and why the killer is doing that. But this show averts your expectations by actually making it about the entire main cast. This will be the formula going forward in all the other seasons, but season two does it way better, and so does season three. And for the most part, all the other seasons. Why? Because the killer is actually going after people who sin. He is a religious Zodiac killer. And so if you committed one of the seven deadly sins, he will go after you and stuff. And so what triggered this was when the main lead returns back to her hometown after so many years of being um, gone. And so he now starts to, well, the killer now starts to like, you know, go after people who have done some of the most horrendous stuff in the past. The problem with this is that when you find out what they did is very brief and there aren't that many flashbacks and sometimes they will just tell you with no flashback. This was a very messed up way of trying to show what these people did was so terrible and trying to make you either like or hate them as a person. They should have focused more on flashbacks instead of just that of the present day, instead of giving us a small snippet of what this person did in the past. And also, a lot of what these people did do not tie in at all to that of the main character herself. So it's just kind of odd. So it's kind of like, why even have this? You know what I'm saying? Now, in other seasons, and especially season two, Aaron fixes this. He gives us multiple flashbacks. He gives us really juicy details about these people's past and they're more interconnected to that of like the, um, the killer and stuff like that, or at least the main like character. It took him a while, but he got his, um, you know, his footing and everything, you know, it happens. But nevertheless, it is like very interesting to see how these people like get killed. What they did that was so terrible, it just would have been so much better if there was more detail to it. Now, when it comes to that of the kills, they are very, very gross and like just nasty. But sadly, sometimes it cuts away from the kills or it happens off screen. And that's probably because of how gross it is and how they start off with the kills. They're probably like, okay, we can't show the rest of like, you know, these kills because it's kind of like sensors and everything. And remember, this used to be on t television first on Chiller. Then it went on over to Netflix and then it went on over to Shudder. And when it went to Netflix and Shudder, then they was allowed to show a whole lot more gore. And the one good thing about this killer is that this killer rarely ever just goes around killing random people and stuff. Like, this killer only sticks to who they are targeting. However, they did attack this one person because, like, this one person, well, they was kind of like, you know, the killer sees the final girl, Sarah. And he starts chasing after her. And so she's running because for some reason she loves to walk home by herself. Daytime, night, it doesn't matter. And these are some pretty big long streets. And so like as she's running home and everything, you know, the killer's coming after her. And then the killer like ducks away and then her husband shows up. Making you wonder could the husband be the killer or not. So she's all like, you know, the executioner was like chasing after me and blah, blah. He sees a group of teenage boys. So the husband's pissed off and he goes and confront the boys, right? Well, so like, you know, and he chases them away um, and everything and scares them off. Well, the one teenage boy is pretty like, you know, antagonistic and like he took a baseball bat and he just like, he's really insulting to his friends. And as he was riding back home, he just took the baseball bat, breaking people's like, you know, mailboxes and stuff. 
and then for whatever reason the executioner like you know attacked him messed him up and then dragged him off and i'm just kind of like okay well what's gonna happen so in the next episode we see what happens to this dude even though it isn't that glory because they can't show all that much blood and all this other stuff my god the shocking reveals and twists and turns will really get you because you're not really expecting this to happen but it has to be a coincidence that these things just happen to line up in order so there's this one couple they're out in the field and they're about to do it and it's daytime right so they're out in the field they're about to do it then all of a sudden somebody pops up from the grass with their eyes bloodshot and like sewn up or, or busted open or something like that and like, <laughs> and it's the boy the teenage boy that the executioner messed up and everything scared the crap out of that couple so he left that boy alive and did not kill him because he only goes after those that are on his list, the seven deadly sins and everything. And so with the killer committing that, this, um, killing folks who have committed like, you know, the seven deadly sins, you know, like lust, greed, envy, uh, sloth um wrath and you know like so on and so on and so on right and so like it's a really huge cast so they give you enough people to make you wonder all right who's gonna get their comeuppings like which like seven deadly sin did they commit and who exactly is the killer now there, there are like you know nine people that die but eight or from the seven deadly sins two committed the same sin at the exact same time so let's see how i'm gonna do these character bios um i guess i'll get into the original executioner so tom winston he is the original executioner and he's also committed a set um a, uh, one of the deadly sins he committed pride so Tom, no, it's interesting because, you know, when he killed Sarah's parents, you see him sitting in a chair after he cut the stomach open and everything and delivered the baby because the wife was in her um, about nine months in. And so, like, you see him waiting for the police in a rocking chair just holding baby Sarah as she's crying. And it's just kind of like okay that's interesting i probably know what's going on with that but the question is why did he allow um this one guy named alan to like you know survive and run off then a little bit more later but it was just interesting how he was holding baby sarah in his arms and it made me stop and think oh he must be the real father like why else would he do that you know what i'm saying and so the dude's weapon of choice is a big old machete, one with a serrated edge to it. And so, like, as he's now in prison, because he didn't even try to fight this, he didn't try to run off or nothing like that, right? So he's in prison in the present day, and Sarah goes to talk to him, I want to know, hey, why'd you kill my parents, blah, 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 there's a second executioner, what do you know? He knows a lot about Sarah's parents and he's the one who causes Sarah to start investigating this and he tells her go to a certain room in your house and you will find like these tapes hidden in everything and they turn out to be sex tapes sex tapes of that of Sarah's mom and multiple other men because the mom was a prostitute and everything and so like he seems to know a little bit here but not everything right and so next thing you know when sarah's husband dylan goes to visit him he doesn't like dylan somehow like why doesn't he like dylan is it because the dude's black and his daughter's white because they live in the old hick type town right no it turns out dylan was writing tom from prison but sarah does not know more on that a little bit later 
And so, like, when he goes to visit Dylan, he wants a lock of Sarah's hair because Sarah won't give it to him. So Dylan does it, and they have a DNA test done. And boom, he is the actual father. So this now causes Sarah to not only hate him, but to build a rapport um, with him. And kind of just wants to have family in her life because her mom's dead, her grandma's now dead, and Tom is the only living relative that she has. But she's still pissed at the fact that, like, you know, he killed her mom. And she constantly keeps asking him why, and he won't tell her why. And so, like, you know, they have an actually pretty good relationship and everything, but he is a deranged killer and stuff. And so when, like, you know, um, the killer starts to target both of them, he breaks out. Well, first they transfer him somewhere to, like, a medical facility because he got beat up and everything. But then he breaks out. He strangles one cop and he strangles the other in a very gruesome way. The cop survived, but we don't know about the, um, the EMT medic and stuff. And so he basically grabs a cop's gun and cuffs and tells him like you know i'm just here to protect my daughter this and that and then we see those two out on the run out in the middle of the woods in the car and it's rainy and they're just talking and everything of all things right they're just talking and so he later has like a seizure and when he recovers he is kidnapped him and sarah kidnapped by that of the executioner because both of them have committed pride and you know the whole doing of god's work and having too much like pride and stuff like that and it turns out sarah like you know tried to off herself years ago because of what tom did and everything so tom being the loving father that he is he finally decided to confess and so, like, if it could just spare his daughter's life. So it turns out, like, I was wondering, like, you know, what is the deal with Tom and the mom and why he killed them, stuff like that. He used to be a pastor back in the day. And he helped clean up the streets of prostitution. Well, it turns out that he didn't know that Sarah's mom was a prostitute. And he started having relations with her to the point that after all that sleeping around, he fell in love knowing she had a husband and him being a pastor. He know, you know, he committed uh, adultery and everything. And then it turns out Sarah's mom set him up. Because he didn't know he was being videotaped and everything because her husband comes in and he's all like, this is what's going to happen. You're going to stop shutting down all this prostitution stuff and like, you know, um, or we're going to let this tape like, you know, spread and show everybody the sinful pastor man that you are. And I think they mentioned Alan and how Alan's the one who sells the tapes and stuff like that. So this dude was pissed that he got blackmailed and everything, and he's even more pissed he got duped. So when, like, you know, he went to go kill, like, you know, both of them, he let Alan leave because Alan wasn't there, but he knows Alan's the one who sells the tapes and everything. But he kills um sarah's stepdad then as he's about to kill the mom she confesses that the baby is actually his and then she talks about how oh i really did love you but i couldn't like leave my husband because he was gonna kill me and all this but tom didn't believe her stabbed her in like you know the head and everything or throat or something like stabbed in the throat and then gave her a c-section <laughs> Because I'm pretty sure he would have probably killed that baby too. But then when he found out that it was his, he had empathy and stuff. So, now that Sarah finally knows the truth, he is now ready to off himself. And like, you know, so he can spare her life. And there's a buzz song. And so, he just jumps on it and everything. 
so much blood spilled out of that like oh my god <laughs> verna she committed wrath so she is the nosy neighbor of like you know sarah and she's been living there for years right and so this woman does not like sarah because she doesn't like sarah's mother but we don't know exactly why and so then we see her breaking into like Sarah's house, eating the food, and then watching some of Sarah's mom home videos. And so then it's later revealed that one of the men in the video is that of Verna's husband, her now late husband. Why? She killed him. <laughs> she found that out years ago and killed his behind. And so she's really mean and rude and always talking about how you need to keep an eye on Sarah because, you know, she, um, the way she dresses and the way she acts and floozy stuff like that. So the executioner breaks into her home, chases her down, and then chops off her hands and legs and let her bleed out. She's a very minor character. Now, we never get to see her flashback of her finding out, like, what her husband did. That would have been very helpful and everything. Justin committed gluttony. So Justin is the married husband of Robin. They're a gay couple and they're into real estate. And so they befriend Sarah when she moves in town because they help, you know, get her her arts um, museum and everything so she can put her artwork there and stuff like that. And so, like, we don't know much about them. We know robin likes to cheat a lot and everything and i believe both men actually cheat on each other and stuff like that but we mostly just see robin cheat more now with justin it's kind of like what the heck did he do because they're so nice and everything right and so it turns out that he ends up dying from rat poisoning why because the executioner put rat poison in his crack <laughs> so he snorted that up in his nose poison blood and you know bubbles and stuff came out of his mouth it was disgusting but what the heck did he do well we never see a flashback which is a huge problem but we get told what happens you're supposed to show and not tell well it turns out he's very aggressive and he wanted this one home of this one family and he forced to kick them out and the new place they lived in i guess didn't have no like proper heater or something like that and so they made like a makeshift one and burnt and so i guess like you know they burnt to death and stuff like that and it's like these people they do this stuff and they just i don't, I don't know how they can just live with themselves you know and so the executioner offed him but robin is still alive throughout the entirety of this season and stuff like that Brenda committed envy. So Brenda is actually the grandmother of Sarah. And so she is she doesn't want Sarah back in the house. She wants Sarah to just leave the town with her. And so Sarah can be safe because you know the executioner has come again. The grandmother's pretty snarky, pretty rude, and stuff like that. But then we go and see her visit a older woman, because they're both older, you know in the hospital who's in like a vegetative state the woman has like a neck brace or something like that on her head and all kind of stuff and this other older lady comes in is all like oh i'm surprised to see you here because you never come to visit and blah blah but i'm here almost like every week and everything and so it's kind of like well what the heck did she do now When it comes to the first three people that I mentioned that, you know, um, have died and stuff. Oh, no, uh, no, the last three, the last three out of the four, their murders or what they did in the past are not connected to like, you know, the overarching like story or that girl Ariel. So there's just pretty much random just thrown in there. I wish they could have connected because it would have made the flow better and it wouldn't have mixed reviews and stuff. So what she did is when she was a teenager and I guess it was like prom or something like that. 
she was like on top of like you know the bridge or whatever and she saw this car pass by took a big boulder and threw it at them and it was a convertible and it hit the one girl who's now in the hospital it's an older lady she was jealous of this woman and everything and just didn't like her and wanted to scare her but instead it hit her and she's lived with that for many many decades and just went on with her life and everything so the executioner tied a rope to her feet and to a giant like boulder brick and threw it in the river or lake i can't remember which one and there she drowned and everything and was later cremated and it's so gross because like they actually showed how they cremate people like they showed how they do it it is disturbing trent and june they are both um paramedics and stuff and june is married to officer cam well what they did was sloth and so basically they had an affair but that's not the only thing they did see a few years back there was this teenage girl by the name of ariel and she was just a drunken girl uh, coming home from a party and she went missing and so they claimed, you know, oh, we don't know what happened to her and blah, 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 and stuff like that, right? And then the video footage shows that she did indeed get into a car, but then more video footage showed through like the mirror angle that June was there the entire time. Now, June is a drunken woman who literally got naked and swam in like a lake and stuff like that. And Trent is just some redneck dude who's a hunter and his uncle was Vera's husband. So, the executioner, and I could not believe how both these people died because it was gross and, and freaky and stuff. So, okay, Trent... He was out hunting like a buck or something like that, right? And the executioner started hunting him. So Trent started running and then all of a sudden he falls into a pit. Interesting how the pit just happens to be there and Trent just happens to fall in it. Even though the execution wasn't constantly shooting at him to make him go in that direction. I hate plot armor like that, but he falls into a pit. So what does the executioner do? The executioner takes a bunch of snakes, poisonous snakes, um, the kind that wrap around your body, and this one really deadly Australian snake. How this person got it? Heck of I know. And just threw them on top of Trent, and they bit the crap out of him, killing him and stuff. The big bumps that was on his head was disgusting. As for June, and I couldn't believe this, because most of these kills and stuff like that, sometimes they happen um, at, um, towards the end of the episode, some will happen early, hers happened towards the very end. So it left off on the cliffhanger to the next episode. He took her, he gave her some type of paralyzing um, drug to where she could see everything that's happening, but she can't move her body. She's completely butt naked, laying in a huge field, maybe like a wheat field or something like that, right? And on top of her private parts, and her private parts only, are honeycombs. And I'm like, well, what the heck is supposed to happen to her? I'm like, oh, wait, if there are animals, could we see a rat running by? Well, <laughs> the bugs and the animals ate her behind so in the next morning this couple's out in the field and they're making out and their dog runs up to something and starts eating it and it's june's half eaten body all bloody and red and the dog's just chewing away as you see bugs coming from it as you see maggot worms coming from it it is gross and disgusting ate that woman from the inside out <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha!
Alyssa, she is the head of like this newspaper that's in town and it's the one that Dylan works at and she's one of those very aggressive journalists. She wants you to really push and get that story, right? And she wants to know all she wants to know about all this execution and stuff because it's big for her business, right? And so like she even tells like you know um she even interviews like you know dylan's wife and all that stuff making her feel uncomfortable and it's putting strain on dylan's and sarah's relationship but Alyssa doesn't care and so then somebody suggested that she, then she's all like the executioner i want to interview you and everything like she tells that on like this woman's news channel right I could not believe what happened next. Something I have never seen in a slasher movie. The killer accepted and told her to meet him at a certain location. Like a fool, she goes there by herself with just like a camera and a chair. And it's a pretty dark secluded place and it's like little tower thing. But she has pepper spray and a taser. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no gun, no knife she didn't bring, and she didn't even call the cops. And so here comes the execution. They're all creepy and everything, and she's freaked out, and she's giving her interview. And so then at the very end, he asks her, have you sinned? And she's like, no, I haven't sinned. So then he just lets her go and everything. And I'm just kind of like, man, I've never seen anything like that. So now she's feeling good about herself. Thinking, oh, man, look how bad I am. I talked to a killer and everything, right? Well, she happens to reveal to Dylan while drinking that she actually did commit a sin. She is responsible for the death of a man named Benny. And so the executioner found that out and well <laughs> kidnapped her behind um because she committed greed and everything and this was shocking and gross right you know how you at like a restaurant and you're eating something and then all of a sudden there's like i don't know like finger like hair or a fingernail in your food now one time back when i was in college i was hanging out with this friend of mine from class and i guess her roommate decided to come on along i don't like her roommate her roommate got on my stinking nerves throughout the entire time we was there have you ever noticed that when you're hanging out with somebody and their best friend or whatever roommate kind of tries to want to sabotage because they feel kind of jealous that here's this other person butting into their friendship and so they kind of like they try to act like as worse as possible anyway so this woman she ate her burger and out came a fingernail this is the real life that you know happened like you know i'm like gross man you should like get a free burger for that like or you shouldn't have to pay but she's all like no it's okay i'm just not even gonna bother uh-uh, I would have got free something. <laughs> anyway, so in, back to the show. There are these group of young people, right? Right in their 20s or so. They have nothing to do with the show. And they're at a restaurant. And they're being rude. And they're eating the food. And then one guy's like, what the heck am I eating? He pulls it out of his mouth. He peels it open. It's a ear. <laughs> The police goes to like the back of the kitchen area in the deep fryer and pull out Alyssa's severed head. All crispy and fried like some chicken. Ooh! <laughs> so speaking of Ariel and speaking of Benny, let's get into this family. Ariel, Benny, and Heather. Heather is the mom of Ariel and her husband was Benny. Now, Heather is played by the actress um, Being Erica uh, from the show Being Erica. Uh, I think her name might be Aaron in real life. I'm not sure. So she worked with Aaron before. So, you know, she did a couple of seasons of this show because he wrote for like, you know, Being Erica. Anyway. Heather has gone completely mad. She misses her daughter to death and she's pissed that her husband killed himself. Why? Because like I said, Alyssa. See, Alyssa needed to pin this on somebody, but she couldn't find out what happened to Ariel. So she just lied and said that Benny was doing nasty things to his daughter and kidnapped his daughter. 
this was not true but he became public enemy number one and he couldn't take the heat of being accused of stuff so he offed himself this caused like i said heather to go like nutty in the head and stuff and so like when it comes to that of ariel we find out in a very shocking reveal the person who kidnapped her is none other than police chief lane turns out when she came back from a drunken party because she was upset with her boyfriend she was walking home and of course the, the paramedic people trent and june didn't want to help her out just left her there and so next thing you know a cop shows up and he's all like i'll give you a ride back home they start talking but then he doesn't drop her off home he's all like no nah, you want your mom to see you drunk you about to just like you know wait a couple of minutes and so he drove her but then he put her in a secluded area she got creeped out tried to get out and he forced himself on her the shocking reveal is when he comes home and he sees his wife and so when he sees his wife him and his wife don't get along she can't give him kids and their marriage is on the rocks so we see him just go to see he's really pissed with the whole executioner thing he doesn't want people to think that the executioner thing is real and he doesn't like sarah and how sarah's investigating and everything is just going crazier and crazier so he's grumpy he goes home and then we see him go down in the basement and he opens up a giant metal door this metal door is about four inches thick and so like i don't know maybe eh, three inches probably two three four inches something like that thick and in there is ariel he has her trapped down there and has her down there for about two years two or three years and it's a little boy named jake who calls him daddy yeah shocking 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 so she wants out bad he won't let her she tries to escape right and so like she even makes a makeshift knife and put it to his throat and all like give me your key no she should have cut him but she didn't and so like the wife knows about all this but doesn't do anything about it so she actually makes it up like through the house and tries to escape but then the boy falls and the dad gets him so she's stuck on the steps and she can't leave so at some point in time when sarah's talking to um lane and everything because he doesn't like her and it's revealed that this one seedy older lady who sleeps around with people and do drugs she's been running off the mouth now, I forget this lady name, Maureen or Maxine, something like that. Her story kept changing about what she saw that night when Cam and Sarah are like investigating her and stuff. This pisses off Lane and he shoots her up with like a drug and it kills her. And so like, you know, when Sarah and Lane are talking, she deduces that it must have been him that picked Ariel up that night. So he then tries to kill that of uh, Sarah anyway she's able to somehow like escape and so he knows he's busted and he heads back to his home and he's gonna literally set himself sarah um uh, not sarah but um ariel and that of jake on fire but he decides not to and when he escapes and everything he's on a boat and he goes to his boat house out in the middle of nowhere as soon as he's inside the house all of a sudden the executioner grabs him and then it's kind of like wait hold up how does the executioner even know that he has a boathouse and then it's all like oh hold up and by the sixth episode you start to figure out who the killer might be well the executioner i don't know how they did this but they um sent his body to the morgue to be cremated and we see the morgue dude there not even knowing that the body's still alive as he put it in there and stuff like that. And so he gets cremated and stuff. But the question is, then you, like I said before, you start to figure out who the killer is. Because, like, you know, how would the killer know that the police chief's boathouse home, whatever, or lake house is, you know, out there? 
how was he able to get it to the morgue um being undetected and making them think that the dude is dead and stuff you know so let's get into dylan next to husband now i've said before they did a pretty good job in making people assume that you know dylan was like the killer and stuff when the killer would show up somewhere and disappear and dylan will automatically show up um dylan um uh, was told by no he overheard um Alyssa talk about how she framed this one dude Benny and everything and he listened to that so you really start to think that now Dylan is the loving husband of Sarah he loves her he protects her but his job is getting in the way he's becoming one of those aggressive reporters who just wants to get the story when Sarah and her grandmother wants to hightail it he wants to stay there and finish the story so it causes them to all stay. Now, like I said before, it is causing a strain on their relationship. But then when he goes to visit her father, there's a deep, dark secret that Dylan has. Oh, Dylan is played by the dude who was the red SPD Power Ranger uh, from Power Rangers SPD. I couldn't believe it, man. It's been like, what, 10 years since, about 10, 13 years since that show. He got older and bald and I couldn't believe it and stuff. So anyway, um, his dark secret was that he knew who Sarah was before they started dating because he's been looking for her to do this story and everything. See, she went on a website trying to figure out, you know, who this new executioner is and stuff like that. And the person said, if you have any leads to email this. Well, as soon as she emailed it, his phone started to chime. So then she kept sending the email over and over and his phone constantly chimed. She went into his phone and saw that he's the one who made this website. And it turns out he only started dating her so he can get intel on all this executioner stuff. But then he accidentally fell in love with her and stuff like that. So she's pissed, she's fierce, and she don't want nothing to do with him. And on top of all of that, he gets framed by the real killer who, when the killer kills people, he takes the momentum from their body and puts it in a box. When she was packing, getting ready to leave after I, I guess she had forgiven him and stuff, she finds the box. So she calls the cops and he gets arrested and everything. And so, I might as well get into the new executioner himself, Officer Cam. This came as a big surprise in the first five episodes when you watch it. But then when you watch about the six or seven, things start to make a little bit more sense. It makes sense why he didn't kill that boy, but punish that boy for vandalizing people's, like, you know, mailboxes, but also you know well only because of that also like you know he killed his own wife june is his wife and he didn't know she was cheating and stuff like that and what she did to that aerial girl so he wanted revenge because of that but he played it off like he was so innocent and he's always been there he's always showing up and of course because he's a cop he's always showing up but now you know why he ends up in a place in a split second and everything after something bad will happen and so like you know he's been playing everybody and i mean everybody so at one point him and sarah was investigating a place that was the layer of the killer and they see all these drawings right and they're pretty disturbing and so she okay, what happened was he framed dylan and the moment dylan is arrested and i kid you not see he has feelings for sarah and in the moment dylan got arrested because sarah called the cops on him they clickety clack and they clickety clack hard up against the wall and without a condom and I'm just like, dude, she's been wanting to do this for the longest freaking time. 
You know what I'm saying? Because they knew each other at summer camp and everything when they was teens and she grew up in that town. So he always had feelings for her. She always had feelings for him, but they never did anything. But throughout the entire season, you don't see her have feelings for him. You see him have feelings for her, but not the other way around. So it was shocking that they went and did it. And the moment her husband gets like arrested because she's still pissed off at him thinking he's like the killer. Now Dylan technically did kiss another woman, but she kissed him while he was drunk and he started kissing her back until he rejected her and all like, you know, I got a wife and this just ain't gonna happen. But neither one of them finds out about the infidelity. But for Dylan, he's innocent because he need, that woman kissed him first, but he did kiss back. But she went and screwed the dude who's a literal murderer and everything and framed her husband. So anyways, as she's reminiscing about her um, camp days, she's looking at like the pictures and sees Cam back when he was 15. And he's holding up a picture he drew. And it happens to be one of those demonic pictures that they found in the lair of the killer. So she goes to Dylan and she tells him, you know, you've been framed and everything and she's going to find evidence. She goes to like, you know, that of um, Cam's place and finds like the killer's knife. And by the way, this is a big knife. It's at least the blade is at least 13, 15 inches long. And it's a serrated knife similar to the machete. And she finds some severed body parts and blood everywhere. So she starts to call the police, but then she hangs up because she knows, of course, Cam's a police officer, but she doesn't even take no pictures and stuff. Instead, she sets Cam up. And here's the thing. Remember Alan? Remember how I said Alan um, was there when Sarah Parents got killed, but the executioner let him live, but just put a scar on his face and stuff. Alan later became a pastor and he is the accomplice of Cam. So this is how Cam found out all the bad stuff people did in town because of course what the people do, they confess their sins to a pastor and everything. And a pastor is supposed to keep their mouth shut no matter what they did. And so he went to his son so his son can clean up the town of all its smut. And this also was a good framing to Dylan because these murders didn't start until him and Sarah came into town, making it seem like he's the one who um, done everything. So father and son are literally an accomplice to all this murder stuff. And so, but then, see, this is what happened. When Cam was like, I don't know, like 13 or something like that. No, probably about 10 or something like that. He had a mask on his face and he came in his parents' room. Very Michael Myers-like, right? And he was sleepwalking. The mom wakes up and is pissed. Then she's, she realizes that her son Cam pissed himself in the bed and she's all like, you're too grown for this. And she starts mocking him. And then she's all like, uh, look what time it is. I'll be lucky just to get two hours of sleep before I have to go to work in the morning. So she just starts making fun of him and being mean to him. And Cam pushes her down the steps and she dies. Alan wakes up, sees the body is upset. He tells his son it took him many years to forgive him and stuff. But then when Alan realizes that older Cam is starting to keep mementos of people's body parts and everything, he is freaked out and, talks, and tries to talk to his son while at church. Cam don't like this and decided to strangle and kill his father because his father also commits sin himself and also because his father is supposed to be this holy man, but instead he does like this bondage type stuff with a dominatrix and gets crucified and, and spanked and all this other crap, right? So now Alan's dead. Sarah, played by Katie McGrath. She played Lex Luthor's sister in the Supergirl show. She's an Irish actress with a fake American accent. And she does it pretty good with that American accent as well. She was also in Merlin and she's about to be in season two of The Ex-Wife replacing Janet Montgomery. Sarah is a pretty headstrong woman. 
and extremely smart. She's an artist with an art gallery and stuff. And we see her making paintings and stuff like that. But once all these murders start to happen in her hometown, when she has moved back to, she starts investigating and she's a really good investigator. She should be a PI or something because the killer is giving her clues, this and that, and she's following them. And then she's realizing what these people done in town It's so much that the police chief, you know, she gets on his nerves and everything. And of course, like I told you before, her mother, she knew nothing about her mother and then found out her mom used to make sex tapes. And the girl was born on Halloween night <laughs> because her dad cut her out her mom's stomach. She later forgave her dad. The shocking thing of all, even before she knew what the um, mother had did, lied to him and stuff. Because she literally told him, like, why? Why did you kill my mom? Like, you could have, like, went to um, children and family. You could have kidnapped me and everything. You didn't have to do all that. But she later forgave her dad for all the nasty stuff that he did. But then it turns out that she once tried to take her own life because she couldn't deal with it. Being the girl born on Halloween who, you know, from this crazy mass killer and everything, right? So, like I said before, she assumes Dylan is the murderer. She calls the cops. She sleeps with Cam only to find out that he's the real murderer. But instead of going to the police, she decides to set him up. She goes to like this Halloween party, ah, the anniversary. <laughs> and while talking to Robin and everything, she sees Cam and she's pretending to make out with him. Behind her back is the killer's knife and she stabs Cam in the gut. And remember, this blade is about 13, 15 inches. It is big and it is thick. Somehow in slasher movie fashion, Cam survives that, pulls it out, slashes um, Sarah and slashes Robin. Sarah takes off running and Cam, whose stomach's bleeding now, is able to chase after her. Not only is he able to do that, but when Dylan shows back up at the house, Dylan, like, you know, fights off um, Cam, but Cam somehow is stronger than Dylan with a stomach wound and everything. So he um, bashes his head into where he's useless. And then him and Sarah go at it again. And he stabs her a couple of times and stuff. And then she's screaming and everything. At some point, she's finally now able to get the upper hand on him with the help of Dylan. Dylan puts him in a chokehold while Sarah, my God, starts stabbing him over and over and over again very slowly. Talking about all the people you killed and blah, blah, and stuff like that. And the dude is still alive. <laughs> it's on, and she even locks the door to make sure the cops won't come in to trap his behind in there. As the cops are banging on the door and she's realizing, hey, we need to hurry this up. She slits his throat. <laughs> and now he's finally dead. So, her and Dylan have reconciled, or um, she doesn't tell him she cheated on him, and he doesn't tell her about the kiss. So now they finally going to move. Robin has now sold the house to a new couple, but won't tell them about all the murders that happened there. And in a weird way, which I wish they didn't do this, I guess they, they want a nice little teaser at the end. The couple, they go in the house talking to Robin and they have a little girl who's about 10 years old and she sees a cat. So like, oh, aren't you a pretty cat? And breaks his neck. Then she goes into the house pretending like nothing happened. That was really unneeded. Like we didn't need that towards the end, but I guess because nothing built up to this because in the next season, it's an anthology. So everything's completely different now with a new cast and everything. And sometimes recurring cast members come into this show. They'll just play like a different person, right? But in season two and three are actually, no, no, no. Season three and season four are actually connected. So there's this one actress. She appears in season two, three, four, and five. And she's prominent in season three. But she's cuckoo crazy in the head. But then we see her in season four. That happens years before season three. And she has a cameo. 
This is the only connected season, but it's kind of odd because once again, some of these same stars um, recur in other seasons playing new characters and stuff. Like Dylan McDermott, I think his name is. I don't know. who Whoever Tori Spelling's husband or ex-husband is, he has appeared in at least three different seasons playing different characters. He was the cop in this season. He is the only American actor to play in this show. However, he wasn't in season four because it wouldn't make sense because he was in season three and those two are connected, but he was not in season five. That's the season that took a huge hiatus and was the last. Like I said before, season one through three are the best, but season three was kind of shaky and everything and they brought in politics. Then you get season four, which I remember not liking and I reviewed that. And I recently, I think earlier this year, reviewed season five and I hate season five. But all in all, this is a really good slasher show. I just wish things could have been connected more to that of the final girl. Cause it would have made more sense to focus it on her and not a bunch of random characters we don't know until we meet them in the episode they show up in. So it took a while for Aaron Martin to get his footing, but he improved big time in season two and a bit more in season three, you know, connecting stuff better. And even though in season four and five, I don't like them, it's still a better connected universe to whoever, like, you know, these characters are. No more are they focusing really on just one main character. It now focuses and it lets you know, hey, it's focusing on a bigger group and stuff like that where there's still this one person who is kind of setting things in motion but all in all you know going in it's about a whole group rather than just like a final girl like in season one that wasn't that spooky all right well i shall talk to y'all later bye <laughs>